Good afternoon, everyone. We will give it a few minutes um, to allow everyone to come in from the waiting room and join with audio and sound. Okay, so thank you all for joining us today. Um, this is part three in a webinar series that we are doing on trauma. And today we are focusing on trauma and resilience in the context of poverty. So before I hand it over to our wonderful presenter, I do want to take care of a few housekeeping items. Um, this webinar is being recorded and so we'll make it available within 48 hours for you to um, review or share with colleagues if you choose to do so. I do also want to note that as participants on today's webinar, you have the ability to unmute yourself. You have the ability to share your webcam. Um, we want to make it very much a conversation, but I also want uh, everyone to be aware that you do have those options to unmute yourself and share your webcam. So if that is not something you want to do, um, just make sure we're not accidentally hitting those buttons. <laughs> um, but yes, if you have any questions, you can put it in the chat. You can use the little raise hand feature down here at the reactions with the little smiley face. Um, if you want to unmute and ask a question, again, we very much want this to be a conversation as well. And so with that, I will hand it over to Shanna and she can get us started. Thank you so much, Brittany, and thank you everyone for making time today. And I want to say a huge thanks. I'm seeing rolling in on the chat that um, several of us have been here uh, for all three sessions thus far. So I just can't tell you how much I appreciate you um, carving out this much time in your busy lives to continue this conversation. So all of you third timers, I'm if you were in my classroom, I'm looking at you as um, really contributing as we go and chiming in with your thoughts, questions. And of course, those of you joining us a first or second time, feel free to do the same. As Brittany said, the more conversational things are, the more we learn from each other. And really the more we tend to step out of theory world and into the pragmatic. So we like to hear what's working for people on the ground. Um, speaking of the ground, I chose this sandy, view to get us kick-started. I mean, it couldn't be a more drastic <laughs> counter position to what we're all experiencing, right? We're experiencing um, really cold temperatures, at least where I am, and lots of snow, and I know many parts of the country. Um, you know, I have places like Texas on my mind today. I'm sure you all do too. Um, what an example, what an analogy for if the right infrastructures aren't in place, to deal with crisis, how much worse a crisis can be. So maybe let's let's frame our conversation that way today that we're all here to just try to build our toolbox, to enhance our awareness, to create our professional infrastructure, if you will, to help our students in the best way possible, including when they are dealing with crisis. So we'll use terms like chronic stress and trauma and crisis and poverty at times it'll seem like we're using them interchangeably or synonymously. I don't mean to do that, but as we've stated before, the reality is when we're talking about strategies and how to be helpful, we're gonna hit many of those buckets at once. Um, so we won't get too hung up on terminology today, but we will clarify if you are looking for the trauma, um, trauma and poverty webinar, the third in our step series, that's short for support for trauma-informed education in post-secondary systems, you are on the in the right place. So we're going to try to focus that way today. Um, as always, there's too much, too much to cover in too short of time. So we're going to do our very best and, and continue on outside of this webinar with our own individual learning as well. Just to recap, this is the third in a series of five, four really content heavy in the month of February. And then in April, we're going to touch base with each other. So I would assume that in that next um, February 25th webinar, we will maybe do a bit of an exercise or send you home, if you will, with a tool to help do some 
um, mental planning on, on maybe something, a bite-sized step that seems implementable to you, um, where you would like to have this group support and maybe space again in April. So be thinking that way as we go through these sessions. Um, if there's something really prominent in your mind, we know that this regards systemic change and enduring change and sustainable change, but sometimes there's a low-hanging fruit that we can bite off and implement right away. So we'll be helping each other, supporting each other with that in April. Today's objectives are gonna sound a lot like the prior two. We're gonna deepen our understanding today um, in regard to adverse experiences resulting in trauma in the context of poverty. It's huge, we'll do the best we can. We wanna increase our awareness as regard to our context in post-secondary ed and how we assist our uh, students and colleagues and families and selves. And we wanna to continue to create that community of professional learning support. So please feel part of a club now. <laughs> We're sharing some extended time together and I'm so glad. So our agenda, the way we will accomplish those objectives, we will have a bit of review again in regard to trauma, um, really focus in on poverty, what it looks like in our society, dive in on that relationship between the two, dive a little bit deeper into the idea of strategies or how we can help. And again, I really hope have lots of dialogue and conversation from all of you. I always start off this way. Um, we're talking about trauma, we're talking about traumatic events, we're talking about um, things that impact many of us <laughs> across the board to varying degrees along a varying spectrum. If you hear or feel anything today um, that is a trigger for you, that puts you in a mental space that's not helpful or healthy for you, we forgive you if you step away or do whatever you need to do to um, join us back in the moment or get to a mental space where you feel safe. And uh, you can join us later by checking out these materials online. So instead of uh, me chatting on and on in review of our um, what we've covered thus far in regard to trauma, maybe I'll just throw it out to all of you. If I could ask you to share with your voice, that'd be awesome, or with the text um, chat, I should say. You know, what, what has really struck out to you in your own learning around trauma? Um, maybe it's something you picked up in a prior webinar with us. Maybe it's something you picked up before. What's a central theme or a big idea that really is prominent with you in regard to trauma? And if you all would share those, I think that would create a pretty good review for us and a review for people um, who are joining us for the first time. So seeing as that I am incredibly comfortable with awkward silence, I'll just give us a moment um, and call on you again. You know, what's, what is a big idea that you already know about trauma? And then we'll know what we need to cover and what we don't. We won't even take a quiz grade, I promise. <laughs> Laura, thank you. There's so many, there's so few people who have not experienced some type of trauma. So we talked before about prevalence. It's really not helpful, to, you know, always to look at your class or your colleagues and say, who has um, experienced an adverse experience or not? You know, it's really more helpful, I think, to apply these universal um, practices and policies that can help all and have this like positive disproportionate effect on people who have experienced trauma. Thank you, Sandy, um, that we all experience trauma differently. This is really dependent on a range of factors that we have discussed. Um, what was the event? What happened after the event? What support structures are in place? What relationships are in place? What are our personalities and dispositions and priorities like? All of these things impact the experience of trauma. Trauma can stack. I like that verb, Teresa, um, and the effects on the brain as well. So we talk about chronic trauma over time. We talk about complex trauma and how that impacts, impacts us in an even more profound way than maybe a single event or experience. Um, oh my gosh, you guys, these are great. Thank you so much. It can affect the relationship we have with our students when we don't understand their trauma. Um, and our own, thank you so much for that. We have to look at it with the trauma-informed lens of ourselves. Absolutely, trauma can impair learning through activation of the automatic, the autonomic nervous system. Thank you so much, Justin. Um, it's a neurological issue. 
that can have physical, cognitive, emotional, and psychological effects. Thank you, Laura. And I know I missed a couple in there, so forgive me. My buttons aren't keeping up with that, uh, with your input, and that's a great problem. So we know all these things about trauma. Um, we won't spend too much time really digging into those in depth, but if you are joining us for the first time, please do so by checking out our prior webinars or other resources um, to really get a solid understanding what is trauma. This is my super simplified definition that I tend to lean on, an event, series of events, or witnessing of an event. I actually added that since last time, or a set of circumstances. It's experienced as physically or emotionally harmful. Whether that's perception, reality is less important than the fact that it's experienced that way to the extent that it overwhelms a person's ability to cope and creates involuntary biological responses. And yes, Christy, we're going to get to the idea of what it looks like in children as well. She's pointing to the importance of uh, relationships as a resilience factor. Now, I just mentioned uh, resilience, but we have to face the reality around trauma that it often has adverse effects on the individual's functioning and well-being. And that's these last couple of points are really what dist distinguishes trauma for us versus something like stress or even chronic stress. Even though they have many similarities, we, we elevate that distinction to trauma when we are really seeing someone's neurological system hijacked in a way that impacts their functioning. Um, so I highlight that there as a key factor. Just a little bit more on that. We didn't look at these images before when we talked about the brain, but trauma is a brain issue. That's why it's a learning issue and a life issue. If we look at these um, scans of brains, the first not impacted by trauma, the second, the one to my right, impacted by trauma and chronic stress, we see how that temporal lobe has been disengaged. Um, and why is that an issue? Because when we're operating more out of our survival brain versus our thinking brain, we are monitoring and reacting to threat. And it looks one of several ways. We fight or we flee or we freeze or we fawn. That's that fourth F having to do with making sure we don't ripple the water at all or cr create any conflict in our world so we don't have to deal with that. Um, as opposed to operating where we usually are in our thinking brain, our decision-making brain, um, that rational place that helps us get back into balance. So when that is offline due to the neurological impacts of trauma, that's where we see differences in behavior that can be really hard for others to understand. Um, you know, that's why we're here. We want to look through a lens where behaviors and challenges and struggles and successes are more readily understood in regard to trauma. Um, if you read Connecting Paradigms by Matthew Bennett, he gives the snake or stick analogy that if you've been bitten by a snake on a walk through the woods, you're going to not only see snakes differently, but you might have a reaction every time you see a stick that looks like a snake because your body is preparing for that adverse experience, that danger. And so keep in mind, some of our students, our colleagues, ourselves are going through life seeing sticks where, um, seeing snakes where there are sticks and reacting as such. And that puts us in a whole different playing field. Um, maybe that puts us in a position where we have experienced some kind of abuse, maybe abuse via yelling and um, really harsh verbal attacks. And so we activate perhaps that part of our response system if we hear a really well-intended in teacher who happens to have a loud voice and a harsh tone and thinks that they're doing well to help prepare us for life, but really um, that tough love isn't working for us because we come from a different neurological position. Maybe as somebody alluded to last time, we can have a reaction when we see security on campus, somebody who's there to help us and wants to do so, but to certain individuals that may bring up a memory a prior experience, um, an emotional response to a situation where there was an maybe a not positive or dangerous interaction with police because they were called to a scene um, that involved danger. So let's keep that lens in mind. Um, 
as we go through, this can manifest in our behaviors, our emotions, our physical wellness, our cognition in so many different ways. So again, forgive these repeat screens, but we wanna make sure everybody's at least on a basic similar playing field that when we're seeing these reactions, they're not always trauma. Certainly these things happen for many different reasons, but they could be related to trauma. And therefore, if we're applying a trauma-informed lens it really impacts our response in a way that I would say is always for the better. Um, so let's keep that in mind as far as warning signs or indicators. Again, trauma does not guarantee an outcome though. It's important to acknowledge all of these risk factors. It's also important to acknowledge our protective factors that can help in regard to how we process a traumatic experience. Some of them are listed there. Um, and I'm really, we're always emphasizing relationships as not only um, being something in line with our gut feeling, uh, it always helps to have a friend or someone loving us. We know this intuitively. This is also a fact that's uh, heavily supported by research, that relationships can be one of the most powerful protective factors in regard to how we process trauma. Again, we, we like to talk as well about resilience. This is that, that phrase that catches this idea that we can have a positive or adaptive response to adversity. Again, there are no guaranteed outcomes. Relationships are important. Locus of control or sense of mastery is important. Our traditions and our cultures, our faiths, and those supportive environments. And that's where we come in today. Because if we are welcoming individuals into our environment for the purpose of learning, I would argue that we have a responsibility to ensure a trauma-informed environment to alleviate some of the challenges some of our students are facing. What does it mean to be trauma-informed? We realize this um, prevalence of trauma in our society and its importance. We might familiarize ourselves with what this might look like with those with which we are working. We respond, and this is a systemic effort, uh, by integrating knowledge about trauma into our practices. And we seek to actively resist re-traumatization or the triggering of past traumas. Often this can happen um, as a result of very well-intentioned actions. So the more we learn about our students and their experiences, the more we can help. Will we always know what our students have experienced? Of course not. Is it our position to pry and find out? Of course not, um, but we can do things universally that help us all and that help our students who have experienced trauma. We are in the process of becoming more trauma aware. That makes us more trauma sensitive. We can start to be responsive in the ways that we interact in our daily lives. And our goal again is that sustainable implementation of practice across the system. Why? Why do we care? And specifically today, why are we focused on the intersection of trauma and poverty? Again, this gives us a lens with which to see um, the people that we interact, the people we live with, the people that we teach, the people that we serve, and ourselves. Um, so that is our quick, quick review. I'm going to go ahead and pause. Um, if there are any um, questions around trauma that's stemming from anything that I mentioned or any clarifications that are needed before we dig a little bit deeper um, into the relationship between trauma and poverty. Feel free to unmute or type in the box if you have any questions at this point. And I'll go ahead and thank everyone for their patience because I know, I know that there are people on this call who um, could be uh, leading this webinar and definitely um, the session in review. Okay, reflecting on poverty. And if you all don't mind, or even if you do mind, <laughs> we are going to start with reflecting and looking at ourselves. So um, we can all have strong feelings around poverty and what that word means. Um, I think it's important, helpful for educators to dust off our own biases as often as we can. Uh, we all have them in different directions. What do you believe causes poverty is a question worth pausing on. Where do those beliefs come from? How have your experiences and exposure to opportunities shaped these beliefs? And how have they differed from others? Uh, do we, are we armed with facts about poverty? 
Are we able to suspend judgment and assume that people are making the best decisions they can from their vantage point and importantly with the resources that they have at their disposal? And how can you assist? Um, are you prepared to assist those who are making choices or, or um, maybe behaving in ways that are different than you? Um, so these are tough questions. Uh, we don't have time to adequately dive into them at this point. We can start, we can scratch the surface, but this is something maybe to take time with in another space and another time. Um, again, all of us dusting off our biases, dusting off how our experiences impact our view. Um, so unless anyone has anything to share in this regard, um, we'll move on for the sake of time, but I think it's important to begin with self-reflection. You know, you might consider um, the story of an individual. This is a single mother of four. Um, there have been two fathers involved, two um, long-term relationships. One is a recent immigrant and absent due to pretty profound mental health concerns. The other parent is, uh, the other father is deceased. So mom's doing it on her own. Um, her older two children are biracial. Dad immigrated from Africa, from Ethiopia to be specific. The younger two children are white. Mom spent most of her adult life living below the poverty line as she met the needs for her kids. And often that would lead to decision-making where she needed to focus on family. And then um, as a result, pulled back from work, became underemployed or at times unemployed. Um, this isn't a hard scenario to imagine. Um, in fact, I'm gonna be super honest and transparent and vulnerable from, with you from the start that this is my story. So I'm that single mom of four. Um, my experience um, below the poverty line has been completely different than others. I absolutely recognize that. Um, I don't have near the challenges that I've seen or witnessed um, in friends and family and those with whom I work. Um, but I think that, you know, maybe looking at each of us through a lens of how has poverty impacted our lives um, or those that we care about is a helpful place to start. So I see a request in the chat box in regard to data on poverty in the US. Um, absolutely, I think that's so important and we can share some of those resources following the webinar. We have a little bit of information on that uh, worked in, but for the sake of time, not too much. So let's um, take note of that request and honor that request. If we think of poverty in different ways, it may or may not be helpful depending on the case, um, but we can think of generational poverty um, experienced by families throughout time. We can think of working class poverty. I think this is something very important to acknowledge. Many people out there working extremely hard and not making the income needed to um, let their families live comfortably. That's a reality that, that needs to be um, looked at. Immigrant poverty is another um, specific label given by the, the agency from which I took these. Um, so I'd like to um, point to that and the kind of um, language and cultural barriers that come with that. Situational poverty, um, these are people who have had something happen that has put them in an impoverished circumstance. Um, it's unpredicted. Maybe they can get back out of it, maybe they can't. Um, there are really, um, so many factors to consider there as we look out at these sea of students that we're serving, um, sometimes it's helpful to try to understand from which this poverty um, situation comes. Uh, thanks from Tammy in the, the chat box. I appreciate you as well. So if we want to talk about economic empowerment um, and look at these poverty guidelines, um, these are the most recent that I found. Um, sorry if hard to read, this was cut directly out of the document. So, you know, looking at a family of four or five, um, those numbers um, aren't too high. It's easy to see how that income could be used um, pretty quickly. And families are making decisions about which bills to pay when, how to navigate um, through the money that they owe, the money that they use, um, and they're, they're doing this. I'd will like to note that, of course, there is um, sometimes supplement from the government um, so like a family of three under the poverty line, average um, supplement income would be around $500. So 
So I don't know, you all, we can all have our own opinions. I don't consider that a game changer <laughs> for a family um, moving through their month. I think things can still be very tight. I use this phrase economic empowerment. Um, sometimes we see things framed around the term financial literacy. I choose not to use that. Um, I do not believe that there is Ill, you know, uh, illiteracy at the root of these problems. The people know money and how to use money and what they need their money for. They don't have enough money. So um, sometimes when we use phrases like financial literacy and how to help people in that way, we lose sight of the fact that there just might not be enough to go around despite people's very um, strong and hardworking efforts. Um, yes, Stacy, let's take note of a need of resources outside of public aid as well. So this is all old news to you, Maslow's hierarchy. We know that when dealing with chronic and toxic stress and trauma, that we are stuck at the bottom of this um, pyramid. We're not getting anywhere close to self and betterment or actualization because we're still dealing with issues of safety and our physical needs. Again, um, trauma is a neurological issue. We talk a lot about resources, money, and how it's allocated. Something that we talk less about is time. Um, and thank you, Jessica. I guess the language we use is impactful. Uh, time, I think, is often the bigger issue. And it doesn't take a stretch of the imagination to imagine that if, if one person is working an hour and making less than minimum wage, they're working a lot more hours than someone who's um, being paid many multiples of that for their hour. So we all know people or are people who are working multiple jobs, Maybe they are working from um, taking care of multiple children. I put another case study up here, I like to pick on single mothers, right? Because <laughs> um, I am one, I can, I can attest to that. Um, we, we really, we need to look at how that time is spent. So this pie graph is just in relation to this um, fictional case study, if you will. Um, I did borrow this. I don't think I would have used um, any slice for TV. I don't know many. Um, parents who have much time for that. Maybe we could swap in something like trying to have quality time with children. Um, but we, when we look at how time is used, um, there doesn't leave much. So sometimes we can interpret things as lack of care. We can interpret things as lack of um, or different priorities of what's important in life. Um, but really often it comes down to was there the time to allocate to that priority? So important to keep in mind in an educational setting um, as we might, because we're human, come to snap judgments about students or their families. I think it's a myth um, that there's no, I don't, do not think there is a culture of poverty. I think the fact that there is a culture of poverty is the myth to clarify. I see just human behaviors and brain science in response to circumstances and stimuli. Um, stereotyping can really compound the issues related to poverty, uh, chronic stress, and trauma. Um, sometimes, you know, the use of people's resources, their money is um, observable at times. And because we're human, we can come to snap judgments about that. Um, we can look at someone and say, you know, how do they have the money for this or that? Um, I'd like to pause here to, to acknowledge the fact that sometimes our um, networks of resources are financial. Sometimes they're based in other currency, if you will. And if you have a network of support that is highly based in relationship, you might do some allocating of resources in ways that um, support or solidify those relationships. So if that means you want to be the place where your kids and friends gather to watch TV, or that means that you want to put on a professional or, or attractive um, appearance and pay for services like getting your nails done, or if that means you're going to wait in line for a new pair of tennis shoes, often people can face judgment around that. And often that judgment probably underestimates the value of relationships um, and how relationships at times can be more impactful, more powerful in navigating our lives than even a bigger paycheck. Um, so then the second step to that is like, are we, are we coming to judgments in an equitable way? 
Uh, when we see news coverage of people standing in line for a new pair of sneakers, and we see news coverage of people standing in line for the new iPhone, is that covered the same way? Or is our natural response the same way? Are both um, attributed as wasting their time or not wasting their time? You know, how do we make those judgments? Um, do we make judgments about someone because they have a smoking habit? Do we say things like, well, they can afford a pack of cigarettes a day? Um, living this life in our society is not easy. Um, living it when under chronic stress or in poverty is not easy. Uh, many people find different ways to cope to take the edge off of a day. Um, my habit is a $5 latte. I don't see how that's really much different when we're getting down to um, basic needs, what people are needing and how they're using to um, their resources. Absolutely, Tammy, there are, there's another level of this where we see addiction um, and we wanna help with that and we wanna battle that. That's a whole other way to slice it. Um, impacting others around you with the smoke secondarily, that's a whole other way we need to look at it. But through this idea of how we use our resources, um, and maybe it, it merits taking a moment to, to reflect on that. Stacy says she believes there's a system of poverty which includes misinformation that leads to stereotypes. I could see, Stacy, how all of that impacts each other in a cyclical way. So we pose these things as a moment of pause. Uh, we talked last time about how when you can get down to people's basic needs, um, things start to make more sense and we start to be able to point to better strategies. Um, so this is just a pause, even though I know I'm preaching to the choir with this audience to not other each other um, in regard to our financial resources. Um, so I hope you don't feel lectured because I know I know the kind of people on the call and I know this is an awareness. So let's look at poverty and trauma together in relationship from a couple of different ways. Um, the first, just that living in poverty is traumatic or can be traumatic depending on those host of factors that we pointed to in individual experience. It's stressful um, in ways that impact us neurologically. Secondly, and we've already started to point to this, there is a cycle where living in poverty increases the risk of certain traumatic experiences even beyond poverty itself. And the effects of trauma can contribute to chronic poverty. So this is a feedback loop that's feeding itself um, we have we see similar feedback loops in regard to addiction, in regard to um, abusive relationships, in regard to lots of other things. Um, but certainly, we can see how trauma and poverty are um, intricately related in this way. So, if we looked at a list of um, traumatic life experiences, it's not exhaustive. It's not all inclusive. It's one list. Um, we can look at each of these things and make a connection to poverty, um, even in a way that's not stereotypical, in a way that's just factual. Um, if anybody wants to chime in and see and can pick one of these items and kind of delineate a connection for us, how poverty impacts it or how it impacts poverty, feel free to do so because I think we can do that with any of these things. Um, it's not a stretch. So I'll pause for just a second as we kind of absorb this list and do so with the lens of how does this relate to poverty? And then if some of you could type, you know, type down a couple sentences about what you're thinking about in the chat box, that'd be great. So let's take a moment with this list. And really, as you look at this list, um, think of your students, think of the populations you serve. Um, what are you seeing in your communities that people are impacted by? I also wanna make note that that last, is, um, that last bullet isn't really a bullet item, it's huge. It's um, historical trauma, racial trauma, um, trauma over generations. We're really going to get into that more in our next session because I have felt reminisce in each of our sessions that we don't have more time to really highlight the importance of that. 
Jessica says a caregiver having a life-threatening illness can impact that caregiver's ability to work, which impacts the amount of income coming into the household. Right. This is cut and dry, right? With life-threatening natural disasters, we will not have the resources to recover, so more stress and trauma. Absolutely. Every time we see a natural disaster, we see how it, it shines a light on disparities. Death or a loss of loved ones. Oh, I'm going to try to get back up there. Ooh. Okay, here we go. Abuse in the context of poverty includes fear, limited options, and shame, right? Very hard to escape these situations if you don't have resources in hand. Death or loss of a loved one, a student living in poverty was additionally traumatized by not being able to pay for the funeral expenses. Additional trauma for not having the resources to deal with the traumatic event in the way you need to to be healing. Speaking to historic and racial trauma impacts poverty in so many ways. Yes, thank you so much. Generational wealth or lack thereof, opportunities for people of color, the communities they live in and lack of resources, absolutely. Traceable to systemic policy level issues that are impacting ways people in inequitable ways. That's me throwing my two cents in, but thank you so much for pointing to that. Okay, let's see if we have anything else. And forgive me, my buttons are cumbersome. As I scroll down, these aren't stretches, right? We see it in our classrooms, we see it in our lives, we see it with our loved ones. Okay, my buttons aren't going to cooperate, but I really thank everyone, you can read, and I thank everyone um, for chiming in in the ways that you're able to. Trying one more time here. Okay, a little bit more here. Okay, that's it. All right, moving on. Thank you for participating. That makes it richer. Considering poverty in America, we could spend all day looking at these numbers. We'll just look at a few. Um, so we have the numbers from the 2010 census. The 2020 will be interesting, but 15% of Americans living in poverty, three out of 20. One fourth working households paying more than half of their pre-tax salary on rent, 46 million people, food insecurity. And then we have the issue of chronic hunger. Two thirds of people living in poverty are working an average of 1.7 jobs. Let's shift our, our thoughts to children and poverty. Uh, in March 2016, the American Ac Academy of Pedi Pediatrics declared poverty as the single most pressing chronic health issue facing children in the US. Um, of course, we know academically achievement numbers are lower for a host of reasons. Recent research shows us poverty is likely the largest determinant of adverse health experience throughout the lifetime. It can even reduce the lifespan. We talked last time about age. I'm going to zoom through for sake of time. Adverse childhood experiences that continue to impact us as we go on and develop. Um, that original study um, by Kaiser Permanente uh, outlined these 10 categories. We've added categories since then to reflect kind of our current realities. Um, and really, when we look at this attributable risk factor, the portion of a condition in a population that can be attributed to certain cause, causal factors, the numbers are so high um, that they're related in a causal way to um, these, these outcomes later in life. Um, it's staggering, really. So we know the severity, we know the heaviness of that. We know the prevalence, one in six American children living in poverty, um, children, poverty, the impact on the brain development over time. It's important though to pause on this one and acknowledge neuroplasticity. We know more now. We used to think so much could happen in those first six years and then things were out of our control. We know now that we have a level of neuroplasticity and we're evolving and changing up through the early 20s. Um, that gives us more hope as far as how those protective factors can play in. But we do face the reality of childhood poverty being very directly correlated with these long-term outcomes. Um, but again, no event guarantees an outcome. We know um, the realities. We also know that if there are protective factors in place, especially that um, consistent caregiver relationship, that children can be protected from these impacts. Early investments in children um, prove fruitful if you look at the research. 
Uh, we know this, so we know we have that hope. We talk about childhood experiences because we know that it impacts us as we go. So let's shift to, to the students in our programs. But first ask this question, will they make it to our classroom? We know that that's impacted um, by financial considerations, family responsibilities. I pause on this note about preparation in secondary ed. We know that the same courses aren't offered in our schools and lower income areas. We know that within those schools, students um, of lower income backgrounds are not always afforded the same encouragement to take higher level courses, the courses that they need to transfer into post-secondary. So we could have a webinar on that, but we pause on that here um, and health impacts whether or not we continue on in school. But of course we want to, looking at the cyclical relationship, poverty makes it hard to continue in school, but if we can, and if we retain, uh, we know how those um, degrees that gain in education, those certificates impact our income generating um, potential going forward. So um, it doesn't take too long of studying this graph to see the farther we go, the better we do in that regard. Um, a, socio a social ecological model of looking at how we can help will really promote a multifaceted approach um, individually, interpersonally, organizationally, community-wide, and on a policy level, what it can be done to really alleviate the impacts of living in poverty. So I'm going to pause here before we get into this idea of strategies or what can be done. Um, pause again on our um, chat. Uh, let's see. Brittany, I'm, my chat box isn't cooperating too well with me. So if you've seen any more pop in, I might ask you to, to relay those if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. And guys, please feel free too, if you would like to, if you have a working microphone, you can absolutely unmute yourself um, and ask a question that way or share any thoughts or comments that way as well. Um, like Shanna said, we have, um, between the both of us, we have small children. so. We like silence, and so we have no problem <laughs> sitting in silence waiting for questions. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> so true. All right, has anything popped in? I have not seen anything yet. Okay, great. We must be doing all right. Um, hopefully, we'll have time at the end to really start a conversation and um, kind of glean more knowledge from the room, if you will. Looking at that system level, um, there are good resources there that we can post um, that really get into what a system, a campus-wide effort can look like in regard to being trauma-informed and responsive to the needs of students in poverty. Um, cultivating a supportive environment is a first step. Um, this gets back to our pause on self-reflection, on biases, um, it extends to how are people greeted on our campus? How are people welcomed? How are they made to feel comfortable? This isn't soft stuff. This is um, powerful stuff. Um, and there, there is guidance out there for how to do that. We covered quite a bit in our last um, webinar in regard to helping people as we deal with pandemic. Um, so cultivating a, cultivating a supportive environment, making sure those conditions for learning are there knowing your needs as a system, um, a data-based approach. Do you look at this data as part of your continuous improvement process, or you might call it a strategic planning process? And more importantly, are the strategies put in place monitored? Are you looking at that monitoring data? Um, what are the measures with which you gauge whether populations are being helped? Um, are you looking at those measures as often as you're looking at, say, the demographic data so that you can measure what's impactful and what is not as part of continuous improvement? Partnering within the community. None of our institutions can have the capacity to meet all needs and be all things to all people. We can have very smart strategic partnerships with other organizations who are doing their part. Uh, promote these things to all students. Uh, the more we try to um, isolate and kind of target our messages, we run the risk of creating stigma around that. Um, so make it widely available to all and make it extra available to those that you think that might be in need. Uh, integrating educational efforts vertically 
within the system. There are so many areas where more vertical conversation and collaboration between post-secondary and say secondary and lower grades within the educational system can be helpful. This is one of those areas. Um, we talked about secondary course offerings and inclusion. That's really getting to the root of things and, and those conversations with post-secondary can help. Recruiting um, students into our programs, removing the mystery of what's possible, especially in regard to finances, letting them know the supports that will be available before they're on our campus um, to make sure we welcome them in. And if there is a retention issue or we lose people, bringing them back in with the supports that they need, making sure we're gathering data on why we lose people along the way. Scaling that support across the system, clarifying and really clearly, concisely communicating the available supports. Simplifying access to those supports. I've heard Brittany talk about an opt-out model that kind of um, opens participation and people opt out as opposed to me uh, asking people to take a step to opt in. That's oversimplifying, but um, I thought that was a really important point. Amplifying those counseling relationships, mentoring relationships within our systems, knowing that those key relationships are so powerful in helping people to meet their goals. We've talked before just what the principles of a trauma-informed approach are, how they, mir they mirror the basic needs of all people, uh, especially people who have been through traumatic experiences, safety, trustworthiness, Choice and control, that, that idea of autonomy is really important. Meaningful collaboration so that their voice is heard. And not only is their voice heard, but their input is incorporated in a practice level, whether within a classroom, on a campus, within a larger system. How are we having that authentic collaboration to have voices heard? And empowering through high expectations, um, believing in people's abilities. We say it over and over, but on the ground level, um, this can be tricky and this can be tough and we see it in classrooms everywhere and at all levels. So how do we keep expectations high and help people to meet their goals? Let's see, need to move in the right direction. Instructionally, what can this look like? Um, so now let's look at the classroom. Curriculum design is a huge tool at our disposal, right? So if we can, design curriculum with variability of learners in mind in all different ways. Kind of a universal design for learning is, is one approach. Um, that can be powerful. I really think um, too, it's important to pause on remote learning as this is a new reality, but a, a sustaining reality, I'm sure that we will be doing more and more in a remote setting um, for various reasons. You know, how do we make sure our curriculum, our instruction is designed in a way where people won't be overly prohibited, if at all possible, by their lack to devices, their, their access to broadband, all of those things. How are we being mindful of privacy when we talk about the view that people are asked to share as a view into their home lives when learning? So keeping all of this in mind when we focus on the academics and what we do. Instructional practices that do all of these things that bolster attachment, self-worth, um, emotional regulation. This is social and emotional learning that is relevant on the post-secondary level. And there are many resources out, out that can show what social emotional learning can look like in a post-secondary classroom. Um, supporting that executive functioning and organization. And we've talked many times about how we measure mastery, how we measure our learning objectives are the learning objectives clear? Do our students know exactly what they're intended to know and know how to do? How do we measure that? Do we have various modes of measuring that if some can, pro can prove an obstacle that has nothing to do with understanding or mastery, but it's just uh, a more difficult vehicle for showing what they know? So being flexible on how we measure mastery of skills and concepts. I think it all really boils down to combating the tendency for individuals to internalize conditions, circumstances that are impoverished as a personal deficiency. So we wanna do everything in our power to combat that or to help people to combat that internally. And there are many ways we can do this. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about strategy in regard to kind of these four theoretical camps um, that's one way to divide it. Uh, there are others, um, but we'll dive in with this frame. 
uh, first focusing on this idea of strengths perspective. Do we acknowledge our students' strengths? Again, this is repetitive, but it's all connected and, and um, intricately um, dependent on each other. Do we look for strengths and skills in students and families? Do we actually acknowledge or stand in awe, I like that phrase, of what people have overcome to meet their learning goals? Um, ask students and families for their help, meaningful contribution, give them opportunities to shine, tell them you're glad to see them. There's a big difference as well between empathy and sympathy. We don't need anyone shaking their heads and saying, tisk tisk, I'm so sorry, but we, if we can empathize or try to understand, we can help people see um, ways to overcome barriers. Asset theory, the more assets a student has, the more likely they will succeed. What are students' assets? Um, how can they be connected to resources to gain more? What are the partnerships? How do they navigate? Um, here it's listed as middle-class world, such as paperwork. You know, um, I know many of you have read about that invisible knapsack that we carry as, as people who have more privilege. Um, how do we help to make up that difference? How do we help to um, point to ways to, quote, get ahead within the system if people haven't been practiced with that. Paltry attribution theory, we've talked about this today. Let's ask why when, when we're trying to understand choices, withholding judgment. Um, rem remember, people have different resources at their disposable. It impacts decision making all day, every day. Um, again, always asking why. And really relying on social capital. This is another fancy way of saying it's all about relationships. How can we introduce people to people that can be helpful for them or to mentor or introduce people to mentors? Um, tell them about opportunities, programs where you know they can build those kind of relationships and really try to make connections face to face. Um, this again is relevant in kind of our distanced world due to pandemic, but it's relevant every day. Um, more comes out of a connection or even a phone call than an email, really get to know people's modes of communication and what works best for them and be willing to adapt maybe your convenience or your own preferred way of communicating to communicate in a way that will stick. But again, looking at a social ecological um, view of all of this, you know, there's individual empowerment, individual responsibility. How can we help people to tap into the things that they can do um, to help them to deal with the effects of their trauma, the effects of chronic stress, the effect of crises. Um, therapy is an extremely important one. Again, that's dependent on resources. So how can we navigate that? Mindfulness, uh, body work or yoga is mentioned quite a bit. Breathing and relationships, always focusing on relationships. There's more. There are more things people can do to tap into their own um, strengths, mental health wise. How can we help them? And again, we are evolving and changing at least for the first quarter, a third of our life. And I would say beyond that as well. Um, so how can we um, keep that in mind as we move forward? Trauma-aware instructors and administrators, we always come back to these four big ideas after we've overwhelmed ourselves with too much information in too short of a time. But this is the best start, right? Are we caring? Are we trying to be aware? Are we showing flexibility in meeting goals and how our students meet their goals? Are we pointing to resources wherever we can? Universally in class, on the syllabus, as needed, in conversation. How can we be that kind of bridging relationship? How can we be a conduit of care for our students? All right, I'm gonna pause on this page um, and we'll get to it in a sec, but first let's just pause. Um, we have a few minutes, just a few. I'd love to hear some really practical examples of what's working for people, what they're noticing in their own systems. Maybe you would rather just bring up a need and ask if anybody else on the line has any ideas. Uh, we've got a short amount of time, but, but again, I'd love to hear about strategies, either system level, classroom level, things you're trying to implement as an individual and in your role. Um, please feel free to share what's working or what needs do you see? And I'll count on you, Brittany, to let me know if anything pops up. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
this is when I wish we were in the room together for half a day, because this is the most valuable piece when people can share what's really working. Another question I'll throw out of, as well is, um, is there anything you heard today that seems like might be a good fit for some of the needs that you're witnessing? We'll allow everyone a few seconds to type in any thoughts or comments into the chat box. Um, but I do also want to remind you that if you would like to, you can absolutely raise your hand and unmute yourself um, and speak with us that way as well. So we did have something come in from Justin. It says, consistent weekly due dates for assignments can go a long way to alleviate the cognitive burden of juggling coursework with other responsibilities. So oh my gosh, I love always that. do it, you know, 1159 PM every Sunday, having that that system set in place. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Justin. I love that consistency. Predictability is huge, especially with someone navigating the neurological impacts of trauma. And it's huge, as you said, in a practical sense, when you're juggling so many responsibilities and time. I don't know about all of you. But as I helped some of my children through remote learning for the first time, and again, I'm talking about kiddos, but I'm talking about teenagers, and it's transferable to adult students. Um, we spent an incredible amount of time doing what I would call working to work. We would um, input and stimulus and assignments and expectations were coming from many different directions on many different platforms. It was different day to day, even within one course. Everybody was trying to figure out, and oh my gosh, teachers are my heroes and they're doing so much, so I'm not picking on them at all. Um, but everyone was trying to figure this out and we would spend entire quote school days just kind of surveying the environment and making sure we weren't missing anything, making sure there wasn't a surprise expectation or assignment or um, you know, a little tidbit here and make sure you do this. We, we spend a lot of effort that way. And I know a lot of people are feeling that way in this more remote world. So I'm loving that very practical suggestion. Anything else? Yeah, Tammy also mentioned um, the importance of predictability, but also with flexibility as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Sometimes it boils down to benefit of the doubt, right? And I understand the importance of um, you know, responsibility and meeting deadlines, and these are all skills that we need to know, but um, we can be flexible sometimes in how people show their mastery. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Yeah, constant communication uh, to avoid long emails and multiple links. This can help to reduce stress and anxiety with our students, allowing time and practice to navigate technology together. Right as opposed to assuming it's a skill that's been developed elsewhere, carving space for that. And I love the idea of concise communications, bite-sized communication. Mm -hmm. Using Blackboard and Canvas or whichever online classroom tools um, to support, to link to support services, announcements um, for counseling, Enforcing syllabus policies consistently can help reduce inequities. Mm -hmm. um, Justin says, I know it sounds counterintuitive, but the idea is that some students, especially first generation, may not feel as comfortable asking for exceptions as those who are not first generation students. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, that can lead to inequities. Yeah, good point. Thank you. And I think that comes back to um, Shanna's point when we are talking about support services for our students and the importance of promoting and sharing those services to all students, to all students as well as their family members if they are involved, because we really do want to break down that stigma that may, may be attached. Um, and as Justin, as you had mentioned, Sometimes first generation students may not be aware that those services are available or who to go to to get that information. 
So making sure that that information is, is widely known throughout your institution can be right. extremely helpful. Right, thank you so much for that, thank you. Oh, I wish we had more time, but we're gonna to have to start jumping off. I um, thank you all for your contributions. Your participation is so um, appreciated and valued. Uh, I also wanna point you to another webinar series real quick as we pop off that the special population series as provided by Brittany on the line, incredible, awesome. I've learned so much. Um, really check these out as far as breaking down what we can do systemically to help different special populations that we serve. So check the, check the ICSPS website for that. As always, if you need help, um, this is one more place encouraging you to reach out. This is one more resource, one more phone number. Um, if you're dealing with trauma or secondary trauma in your role or need help with anything at all, we point to that. And I just thank you. Um, I hope people have found value in this time. I look forward to our next time together next week. Um, again, I just thank you for the work you do and for carving time out of it to be with us and always um, trying to enhance uh, your service to others in your role. Thank you, everyone. Anything else, Brittany? Nope, just a lot of thank yous and very helpful information. So Shanna, thank you very much. Um, I put a few links in there for upcoming webinars within this series, as well as the link to the previous recordings and resources for you guys to access, um, and also the special populations webinar series that Shanna so nicely plugged for me. Um, so yes, thank you all for participating, and we look forward to talking with you next week. Wonderful. And I'm putting my email address in there. For some reason, it's not on a slide this week. So if um, you ask for resources and you don't see them materialize or something was missed or you have a question or something to think about, talk about, uh, please feel free to reach out by email. I really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day.